From Eve and her apple to Madame Bovary, all the Scarlet Letter stories of adulterous women have long fascinated and scandalised audiences and often serve as a cautionary tale. Author Gina Frangelo, however, has brought a 21st century perspective to that age-old narrative, picking apart questions of love and fidelity in her new book, Blow Your House Down. She joins us now to tell us more about it. Gina, thank you so much for being with us all the way from Chicago, I believe. Thank you for having me on. Now, as I mentioned, adultery is a major theme in your latest book, which is a memoir. You reference some of those literary heroines yourself, pointing out that they're often demonized, often tragic. What were you trying to correct or change in that narrative with your novel? So I definitely feel as though, of course, originally almost all representations of women who had committed adultery were written by men and it started a trend of of these ultimately tragic endings often suicide um, on the part of the woman in despair and i feel like although there started to be a lot of feminist twists on that um, where women were writing their own stories and having more agency that even still in popular media um, we often sort of glamorize the self-destructive woman and the tragic end and and the the punishment for misbehavior and i wanted to show a more complex portrait than that i wanted to show essentially particularly the way a middle-aged woman can also make the same sorts of errors or burn her life down in the way that we've come to expect and accept of say 20 something women who whose stories maybe more dominate memoir um, and just show, yes, there are repercussions, but there are also, you know, you keep living, you keep evolving and there is life beyond this. It doesn't always end with going off the bridge or, you know, walking into the river. Now, creative nonfiction is often referred to as a first person account and your prose actually shifts to the second person at times. Unflinching accounts of real life events have always had a captive audience, but in today's virtual world, publishing personal material can be a high stakes game. Daisy Buchanan told us more about that trend. There seems to be this real appetite for those first person stories from women, especially. Although I think that's been, you know, perennial and, you know, definitely way before the 20th century that was happening. And I do, I think that women are so often undermined and made to feel less credible. And there's a sense that, well, if I'm telling my own story, no one can say that's wrong. I know those facts are right. I don't think people were, were deliberately exploited, but there is this pressure for clicks and this pressure to be more and more sensational. Um, and, you know, and what I want to see, I guess, is women women being paid attention women taking charge of the narrative we can certainly say that you've taken charge of your own narrative but since you've written mainly fiction mm-hmm. in the past how comfortable were you being this open and honest on the page <laughs> well of course not comfortable at all um it, it's, memoir is is horrifying you know because during the events that were happening in my life i really did not feel able to write fiction i was i was utterly blocked for the first time in my life i i often do all i could do was sort of scribble in secret about what was actually going on in my own life and so eventually i realized that this was sort of you know this book was the the wall i had to scale to get to the other side Now, one of the very raw and intimate things you write about is the female body, about sickness, about aging. Literature has obviously dealt with that in the past, but what did you feel was missing from the canon? What did you want to highlight about that personal physical experience? Oh, absolutely. So if you want to read a book, for example, about breast cancer, most of those books will exist within the self-help realm. Um, The books that may depict it in literature too often i think don't really go into the the really intimate specifics of not only body but shifting identity and the middle-aged woman's body in general is often somewhat erased from art erased from sexuality we're assumed to sort of stop changing at a certain period of time i really wanted to include that as part of the book because it wasn't just 
okay, I had this passionate affair and I left my marriage and began a new life. My father dies and then I'm diagnosed with breast cancer and then all these other things start happening. So I wanted to show a lot of that messy overlap and the, and the body is a huge part of that. You grew up in a part of Chicago where poverty and violence were not uncommon. How did writing, working in publishing emerge as a possibility for you? So honestly, I did not originally consider these things a possibility at all. I've been writing since I was literally four years old. I used to illustrate and then dictate stories to my mother. And um, because we were quite poor, my mother would buy rolls of butcher block paper and rip them off. And I would write these novels on them. Between the ages of 10 and 15, I wrote four longhand novels on butcher block and notebook paper. Um, however, you know, later on, I didn't consider it a viable thing to study at university because you know, I knew I was going to have to take care of my parents. I knew I was going to have to pay off student loans. And in all honesty, my first marriage was quite helpful there. My my first husband was very supportive of my writing. In my mid to late 20s, I was able to take a break to go back and study writing. The idea was I was going to do it for two years, but I became so involved in it within that two year period that I, I never went back. I started editing magazines. I started publishing work. I started teaching um, at universities and English departments. And then that became my life. Looking at that time in Chicago and then today, we've seen huge protests in that city in recent weeks about police violence, particularly the shooting of Adam Toledo. How does that feel for you looking at the city you grew up in? Is it as bleak a picture as the media might suggest? Or do you see pockets of progress, some social justice? Chicago is a quite segregated city and it remains so. Neighborhoods tend to cluster around certain ethnicities, certain races, and and that I think has changed too little in Chicago. In the world I grew up in, um, it, it was rather romanticized. It was glamorized. The the mafia was glamorized. Street gangs were glamorized. Um, and I do think that Chicagoans these days, of course, are, are fed up. Um, that being said, I also think that Chicago is depicted in the media in ways that are not entirely realistic. Um, you know, you would think if you listen to the media that if you set foot in Chicago, you would be shot dead within 10 minutes of your arrival. And obviously, of course, you know, most of us are living here and this is not not reality but police brutality uh, against black people is happening all over the united states and and including in chicago and it is quite tragic that in a way the more we protest the more the police seem to be digging their heels in and and not only not ceasing and desisting but becoming i think even more flagrant and and so i think that is going to reach some sort of ahead in this country, not just Chicago. Now, America has entered a new chapter with the election of Joe Biden. How do you judge things to be going so far at this stage? Are there reasons to be optimistic? Any elimination of, of Donald Trump um, from from public office is a great reason to be optimistic. It was a true regression in our culture because it emboldened so many people who may have privately thought things and and talked about them around their dinner table who were full of, of hate and judgment of other populations that they didn't understand. But with the Trump presidency, that became a banner under which you could rally shamelessly. The Barack Obama presidency had allowed many people, many white progressive people, I wasn't exempt from it, to, to think that we were on an unstoppable road to progress. And, and the Trump presidency certainly showed us that that was not true. In addition to politics, this year has been quite strange and anxiety inducing for everyone, both on a personal and professional level. A lot of creative and educational endeavours happening like this through a screen. But I believe that you went one step further and actually conducted your wedding over Zoom. Can you I tell us what that came about and what was, it, what was it like? So it, it was, I was planning a literary festival in an absolutely fascinating part of the United States in a place called Bombay Beach in California. My 
then partner, now husband, and I planned um, a free literary festival that involved music, art, environmentalists, writers, about 100 people coming in to, to do these performances over a week period of time. And it had been written up all over the place and we were about to go out there and then COVID hit. And so we had to cancel. It was heartbreaking. We had spent a lot of our time. Um, you know, there was no sponsorship. It was just me deciding to do this and rallying people that I knew to do it. And, um, and so it was crushing. And so essentially the second day of what would have been the festival, my, my now husband and I decided like, let's still do something fun. Let's get married. And, and then we were just going to do it in our house. But one of our friends who was going to originally officiate in California was like, well, for God's sakes, at least do it on zoom. And at this point, of course, like we didn't even know how to work zoom. So he had to walk us through it. And the night before the wedding, we invited about 80 people over zoom and it ended up being, you know, an event that many of our friends were able to attend. And so that was, that it was really, it was quite special, actually. Well, finally, we wanted to know what's on your cultural radar at the moment. So do you have any recommendations for us in the world of arts and culture? I just watched um, a series called Behind Her Eyes um, on on television. I, I don't... Well, I didn't watch a lot of television prior to the pandemic, but of course we all do now. I think for people who like suspense um, and who really want to discover it in real time and not see the end as a foregone conclusion that this was a, a rather exciting um highly tense show okay well we'll leave you then with a taste of that series behind her eyes gina frangelo thanks so much for joining us today thank you for having me it was a pleasure do remember to check in with us on france24.com and on our social media channels too for more arts and culture here on france 24. you keep interfering you don't know what's going on here Stay calm and focus. We're just as messed up as anyone else. Just better at hiding it. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. By giving sovereign.